Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Cornell, the CEO of Jewish Family Services of Greenwich, and I am Zooming in uh, from Temple Sinai in Stanford. Can we, can I want we, to thank all of those that I'm looking at in the audience here at Temple Sinai and from the other synagogues across Fairfield County who are joining us with Shoki Jewish Family Service. Um, we're really glad that you're here with us today to talk through the tragedy in Israel and how to express our thoughts and feelings as parents during this most difficult time with our children. We are going to have a presentation by Betsy Stone, a retired psychologist and expert in child and adolescent mental health. And she has also been a guiding light in our community for many different resources. After Betsy's presentation, um, after uh, the Zoom, yep. Um, all the way up. We'll stay and hold space in your individual synagogues uh, with either a representative from JFS of Greenwich or Shoki JFS. This is a time for outreach. It's a time to be together and to really um, embrace our Jewish community and lean on one another. If you do need resources after, please feel free to reach out to either Shoki JFS or JFS of Greenwich. We are both here for you. And now I will pass this over to Betsy. Thank you, Rachel. I wanna check and make sure that the other congregations can hear us. Jordi, are you struggling to hear us? You got it, okay. And everybody else, Emily, I can't see you, but I am hopeful that you can hear us and Matt as well. Um, and whoever iPhone is, welcome. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do for the brief period of time that we, I am with you is to talk to you a little bit about have, first having difficult conversations with children. This is not the only difficult conversation we will have with children. Um, I think that we have difficult conversations with children around um, some of the choices that they make around um, a, a sex education, around drug education. There are lots of places in which um, parents have to have challenging conversations with children. And so I want to first give you kind of a framework for how I think about having challenging conversations with children. I think they are almost always, but not always, initiated by adults. That kids can sense our discomfort and often know that we don't wanna talk about things and we'll follow that, um, but that we have to ha give ourselves the opportunity to initiate conversations. But here's the, here's the rub, no challenging conversation happens once. No challenging conversation happens once. And so if I want to have a, a conversation which is gonna make me uncomfortable or you uncomfortable, I have to understand that it is in the framework of multiple conversations about the same subject. Um, so for example, if I wanna have a, a sex ed conversation with a child who is um, ready developmentally to hear it, but not ready emotionally to process it, um, or is, is uncomfortable with the idea of processing it, particularly with their own parent. Um, I want, what I want to do is I want to initiate that conversation in a way which allows, doesn't say I'm gonna give you all the information now and then we're done, but says, I'm gonna give you some information now, I'm gonna pause and ask you for questions and I'm gonna follow your lead. This is not the only conversation we will have about this. And so I think that one of the, um, you want me to be louder, Jordy? You can't hear me? Okay, um, I, I'll try yelling. Um, are other people, Matt, are you also having that problem? No, not at all. You're loud and clear here. Okay, okay. Um, it hmm. looks like Jay, Rabbi and, and Rachel are also working on that. Um, the, the basic principle of challenging conversations with children is, first of all, they're often initiated by adults. Second of all, they are usually driven once the initiation happens by children's curiosity. And that actually is an incredibly important distinction. Um, and third, they don't happen one time. They are repeated yeah, conversations. I'm sorry, I'm hearing an echo somewhere. I think they just joined from Orchanash and Fairfield. They're not muted, so I know. Um, okay. Rachel, or whoever whoever the the uh, admin is, please mute them. Rachel, can you mute them? 
that. I, I can't do it. Okay, thank you. Um, Rabbi Gerson, if this doesn't work, we'll do it again just for you, or we'll give you the opportunity to, to play the recording. So I'm gonna start again, and hopefully this is the last time we're gonna start again. Um, basic principles of challenging conversations with children. First of all, they are almost always initiated by adults because kids often will not initiate them um, because of their own discomfort with, with their discomfort with our discomfort and their discomfort with their discomfort. Um, and by parallel, we that when we're trying to teach, give kids, for example, sex education, we often start the conversation, but then we follow them. So we give them information and wait for questions. Second principle, um, I'm doing this in a different order at this point, um, is that adults are tempted to speak in paragraphs, but speaking in sentences is much more useful to kids. Um, we can overwhelm them with information, which is almost never useful to them. Um, but if I answer the question you ask and then create space for you to ask the next question, I'm actually creating a much more of a dialogue rather than a lecture. Um, kids know what they need to know. Um, and we need to know that we don't get one shot at this conversation, that important conversations happen over and over and over again, much as they do for adults in important conversations. Um, so, but they also have to really be developmentally appropriate. Um, a three-year-old does not need to know much at all about what's going on except mommy or daddy or, or, or your teachers are sad. It, and they need the reassurance to know that I'm sad and I'm not sad about your behavior. Um, we really need to be thoughtful about what our kids are exposed to. And that means we have to give them the opportunity um, to understand that yes, I am I the adult am having feelings, and no, there's no, it's not your problem or your responsibility or your fault. Um, that dance is really important for kids to understand. Um, an older kid, a kid who might be exposed to stuff at school, who might be hearing about stuff from other kids, needs to hear from their parents first. Um, and so they may, what we may be saying to them is um, what <clears throat> we may be asking them if they've heard anything, we may be saying to them, um, there's some bad stuff happening in the world. It's not happening to us. It's not happening to mommy. It's not happening to daddy. To the extent to which we can comfortably say to kids, you are safe, um, then um, Rabbi and Rachel, that phone ATW lost audio. Um, to the extent to which we can explain to kids that we are working and they're and they have it back, um, that we are working to keep you safe. Um, and that and and um safety is a really interesting thing to talk about with kids. When we talk about safety, we're talking about something much more abstract than they are. Um, a five-year-old for a five-year-old safety is um I wear a seatbelt and so do you. That's that's a dis, that's a um a demonstration of safety and self-care. Um they don't need again, they don't need long paragraphs about what we do to keep ourselves safe or what we would do to keep them safe. Um their safety is much more concrete than ours. Around six-ish, kids begin to get a concept of death, which is which is actually much more complex. And they begin to understand that death is permanent. Um, that that um, shift is one which may, which increases fear in very dramatic ways. Um, I I would suggest to you that to the extent you can protect young children from any of this information, it behooves you to do so. Um, if there's stuff that's happening in their own family, you can't do that. But I, I don't know why, but why a four or five year old needs to know anything except mommy and daddy are sad. Mommy or mommy or daddy or daddy is sad. Um, when we're talking about 
Now I'm going to flip to kind of another, the opposite edge, end of um, developmental end. When we're talking about teenagers and young adults, um, their fears are real. Um, their experience of anti-Semitism, particularly on college campuses, is real. Um, it it all, also in um, the high school setting and so, to, to some degree in the middle school setting, their experience of, of, of true anti-Semitism is real. Um, and for many of them, this is the most intense experience of anti-Semitism they have ever had. Um, if they're at Columbia, it, where um, someone was beaten for putting up posters of missing Israelis, um, though that experience of anti-Semitism is real and should be acknowledged as real. Um, if your kids are in early teens, they are probably being exposed to levels of anti-Semitism that are new for them. Um, and I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is the ways in which they are exposed. Um, I understand that for many of you, removing social media is a non is a non starter. Um, and I, you know, earlier in the week we were thinking that they were going to be looking at um, torture and murder of videos of torture and murder of Jews. Um, that does not seem to have emerged. Um, I don't know that it will uh, will or will not emerge, but I would suggest to you that those of you whose kids are on TikTok, for example, um, tell them that because your job is to protect them and keep them safe, that you are going to look at their history. Um, because I think our children, I, honestly, I think that one of the roles and jobs of parents is to keep children safe. Um, and so much as I took the car keys away from my adolescence when I felt like they weren't responsible enough to drive. I think we have to do things which will make them angry to keep them safe. And so I would suggest to you that one of the things you think about is um, t saying to them, I'm gonna check what you've been looking at um, to keep you safe. They will push back. Um, one of the defining characteristics of an effectively set boundary is the pushback. That when I effectively set a boundary, you will reject it because you don't like it. Um, that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Um, and I think the other thing um, that I want us to really be thinking about is how much exposure our kids are getting via conversations they're overhearing with us or what we're watching on television. Um, one of the things that we said to people in this area after September 11th very quickly was turn off the TV. Kids can't see this. Um, that was equally true. I'm, I'm a lot older than a lot of you. It was equally true um, at Columbine um, that, that, and I remember my high schoolers walking into the room when I had the television on and saying to me, mom, you have to turn it off. I can't have it on. Good for her. Um, we have to protect our children from the visuals. Visuals are extraordinarily powerful. Um, and we also have to protect our children from our level of anxiety, rage, fear. Um, a final thought, and then I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask me a question or two before you go into your own, before you're in your own spaces together. Um, a final thought. Fear is, um, as a general rule, we don't like feeling bad. We don't like feeling embarrassed. We don't like feeling ashamed. We don't like feeling sad. We'd work very hard not to feel bad feelings. I think that for many of us, bad feelings are actually enormously important warnings. Um, sorrow means I care. Fear is a form of wisdom. And there is wisdom in being afraid. Um, that is not the same thing as saying fear has to drive all my decisions. Um, and so for many of us, there was there is fear about going to shul. There is fear about being in big public spaces. 
There is fear about overtly being Jewish, whether it's by jewelry or association. Um, fear is wisdom and you should listen to wisdom. In the, Fear is wisdom in the same way that pain is wisdom. It is a signal from our bodies and our brains that something is amiss. And frankly, fear is keeps many, fear is what allowed many of us to be in this space at this time. My grandparents, all four of them, um, came to this country because of fear of pogroms. And therefore I am alive. Um, fear teaches us and guides us. And so if you are afraid and if your children are afraid, I'm not sure that the appropriate response is to say to them, don't be afraid. First of all, if they're afraid, they're already afraid. It doesn't really matter what you say. Um, and frankly, I think when we tell people that they shouldn't be afraid, what we're actually telling them is that, that I can't be trusted with your fear as opposed to um, anything else. If your children are afraid, I think the question is, if you are afraid, I think the question is, what tactic do you use to manage your fear and make good decisions? Sometimes those decisions are to avoid the scary situations. I don't get on roller coasters because they scare me. Sometimes the decisions that we make are to acknowledge the fear and move through it. I went to synagogue on Friday night because I needed to be there. And I wasn't going to let the fear stop me. But I was afraid and I was very glad to see the security. So let me take a moment now and ask you if you all have questions or comments that you'd like to share with the group. Um, I see Rabbi Gerson is there. I see Rabbi Telrav is there. Feed me questions if there are questions. Um, or Hadash, if you have questions, the same. Emily, if you have questions. Um, Abby, that's a very cute dog. <laughs> Rabbi Gerson, go ahead. We have a question. Did you hear that, Betsy? I did not. Okay. Nobody else did either. Okay. Hi. So I just wanted you to extend that last point that you made. As adults, we know when to push ourselves through fear and when to step away. I don't know how to address that with my kids and how to, yeah. Great question. Thank you. Um, well, I, th I think you address that differently at different ages, right? Um, I'm afraid to get in a car with my friend John Johnny because he drives too fast is a really different fear than, uh, and, and the approach to that fear is really different than my, I'm afraid of roller coasters. Um, and and I, so I think one of the, I, I honestly think that the question is a brilliant question because it's a question about developing critical thinking. It's a question about being able to, oh no, and we've lost Jordy. So, oh no, you're there, okay. Um, it's a question about helping kids learn how to think. Um, and so I'm afraid, tell me what you're afraid of. Tell me, let's try to figure out what that fear is and what, and what an appropriate approach to that fear is. It's a great question. It's a developmental question. Um, what I do, would do with a, with a six-year-old is really different than what I would do with a 12-year-old. It's really different than what I would do with a 20-year-old. With a six-year-old, I might talk about, depending, what are you afraid of first? Um, so um, when my oldest started kindergarten, she was really afraid. And I said to her, what are you afraid of? And she said, I can't read. And I said, I know you can't read. And you know what's going to happen in kindergarten is you're, you're going to learn more about reading. I don't know if you're going to learn how to read. And for, for a five-year-old, fear is an opportunity to be brave. That is not true for a 16-year-old in many ways, because in many ways for a 16-year-old, fear is an opportunity to be dumb. And so I want 
to do the, have the conversation with the kid that's in front of me, with the fear that's in front of me. Um, but I think really what we're trying to do around this issue is, to, is create opportunities for critical thinking, which is one of the most important gifts we give our children. Um, it, 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 learning how to think about complex things um, is something that many of them don't get in school any longer and is a gift we give them um, that they will need for survival as adults. Um, so I haven't answered your question. What I've said to you is do it with the child that you're with. Not it, There's not a global response. I'm sorry. Rabbi Telrav, I see that you're unmuted. Nope, I have been uh, standing here making sure that we can uh, see the screen properly. Uh, I wasn't even looking at our room to see if there are hands. Okay. Abby, who doesn't look like Abby, go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, not like Abby and not like our adorable dog. First, thank you for being here and for doing this. It, it means a lot and it's very helpful at a difficult time. So I have a very recently a 13 year old who turned 13 last week. And, you know, it's certainly not an adult age and it's certainly not a little kid age. And I simultaneously don't want to overwhelm her with fear and anxiety, but given that she likely will face anti-Semitism, will be hearing about this, I want to sort of simultaneously instill in her a sense of, it sounds so strange to use the word pride at a time like this, but pride, oh, no, and, pride and strength in her Judaism uh, and ready to stand up, but not overwhelm her. So I guess what I'm wondering how do you find that middle ground at that sort of middle age? That's Great you question. I'm in. Great question. So a couple of points. First of all, it's not a single conversation. It is ongoing conversations. And some of it is very explicit role modeling. For example, um, actually, let me let me go off on a tangent for a minute. I promise I'm going to come back to this. And if I don't, you'll, you'll pull me back in. Um, I think that our responses... Um, engage us at three kind of critically different levels. One is our hearts. I'm incredibly sad. I'm incredibly sad. And that level of engagement is actually really uncomfortable. I hate feeling as sad as I feel. Um, I'm also, um, phone I'm gonna try to answer that question too. I'm also experiencing this in my head. And in my, so my head is, I don't want the Palestinians to be slaughtered. Um, that's different than the heart place, which also includes that. Um, but also it, it speaks to this question that phone ATW has asked, I'm struggling to, what is Hamas and what is terrorism? That's, that's information. And the third level that I engage with really horrible news is with my hands, which is what do I do? Um, one of the challenges of being in the United States at this time and not being in Israel, and I'm not saying I want to be in Israel, um, is that there's very little I can do. I can't, you know, after September 11th, I could give blood. I can't give blood and have it get to Israel. But what can I do? I think one of the things that I, one of the solutions for me, and I offer this as a solution for you, is to actually talk a lot about the the Jewish values that undercut my choices of behavior right now. Um, I believe in the value of life enormously. And so what am I gonna do? I can give blood in this country as a response to the, what's going on in Israel. I can, I can work at a soup kitchen in this country because I'm a Jew and this is what Jews do. We take care of people. And so I. one of the things I would suggest to you when you're talking about a 13 year old is, is giving, I think you said it was a girl, I'm not sure, yes. uh, giving her spaces in which her Jewish values are livable in this country. And so that, well, I can't, I can't give enough money to make a damn bit of difference in Israel. I can't give blood in Israel. They don't want me to go to Israel. But I can live Jewish values in this country as a statement of, um, of, of my, my solidarity with Jews everywhere. 
I think the other piece of this, and it kind of it kind of um, makes a bridge between your question and the question that Phone ATV asked, which is, I'm struggling to ask answer my eight year old when the question is asked, "What is terrorism and what is Hamas?" People at school are saying those words. Um, so the bridge here is when your kid asks you those questions, you answer them. You answer them in sentences, not paragraphs. Sent paragraphs overwhelm children, frankly, paragraphs overwhelm adults. Um, what is terrorism? Terrorism is when somebody tries to make you so scared that you can't act in your own best interest. Give And then say to them, give me an example of what that would look like. Make it real at an eight-year-old level. Somebody tries to make you so scared that you can't do what you need to do. Bullies are terrorists in that, with that definition. And I think our experience right now is um, that bullies are terrorists. Um, I, I would, I would, I would, I would um, make a distinction between tr terrorism and bullying, but I think that that's how kids would understand it. Um, what is Hamas? Hamas is a group of people who are doing really bad things. And they're doing really bad things to Israelis. I think the other piece of this that I have become incredibly aware of over the course of the last week that I don't think I would have articulated as clearly as this 10 days ago, is that part of the experience of being Jewish is of being in a tribe as opposed to being a religion. Um, my guess is that when the troubles were happening in Northern Ireland, that it mattered more to people who were Irish than it did to people who were Protestant. Um, that, that our experience of being Jewish is not about, it's, it's not a national experience, it's a tribal experience. And so this sense of distress is a tribal sense of distress. It's not about Israelis, it's about Jews. And the feeling of being vulnerable is a tribal experience of being vulnerable rather than a national experience of being vulnerable. Um, I would make that as a distinction between this and September 11. Um, and, and one of the things I was very aware of around September 11 was how important it was where you were geographically. I have family in Texas. It was much, the, the impact for them was much briefer than the impact for me. Um, because it was, it was local rather than tribal. This is tribal. I hope that was English. I'm not sure it was English. Um, other questions for me before I let you go into your smaller groups. Okay. So what I, um, I just thought I saw, oh, go ahead. Um, Rachel, would you give us a, a, the charge as we go forward? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, I, it's odd to say I'm looking forward to the next part, but there are so many people here at Temple Sinai. I want to thank um, Or Hadash and uh, Greenwich Reform Synagogue and also Temple Shalom in Norwalk uh, for participating in this. And I hope that other synagogues can uh, watch this recording at a later time and maybe have the same format. Uh, so thank you all for participating. I hope you're able to go into your breakout groups and have some meaningful discussion. Um, we wish you well. And uh, again, if you need anything, please reach out to either Shoki JFS or JFS of Greenwich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Betsy, also for your uh, for your words. We, we appreciate it and uh, know that we can rely on you for your counsel during these uh, tough times going forward. Thank you. I'm going to end the Zoom now. <laughs>